Hey everybody, thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at the high yield nerve palsies that present in medical school final exams. So the Medicine Guide is an online free YouTube channel with free videos helping to support medical students throughout their entire journey at medical school. So I've got some videos on how to be successful during the pre-clinical and clinical years. I've got a paediatrics edition focusing on the high yield paediatric topics for finals. I've got an obs and gynae edition again focusing on the high yield obs and gynae topics for finals. And I've got a cardiology edition focusing on the high yield cardiology topics for finals. And this video is part of my high yield quiz edition. So looking at the classical images that present in medical school final exams. So it involves abdominal x-ray, CT head imaging, chest x-rays, nerve palsies, rheumatological and orthopedic images. So let's get started. So today's video is going to be a quiz focusing on the high yield nerve palsies that present in finals. So as long as you've got your pen and paper at the ready, you're good to go. So let's begin. So this is our very first question. So you can either pause the screen at this point or wait 10 seconds when we'll go through the answer. Okay, let's go through the answers. So this is an example of an herbs palsy. So an herbs palsy classically presents after shoulder dystocia during delivery. So a nerve's palsy is because the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, so particularly looking at C5 and C6, is damaged. So in this picture, you can see that the patient's arm is adducted, medially rotated or internally rotated, or the elbow extended. Now, classically, this is known as the waiter's tip position, and this might be the trigger word or the buzzword that you might find in the SBA. And if that's the case, then please use that as a trigger to help you remember herbs palsy. Okay, so let's have a look at the next question. So again, you can either pause the video here or wait 10 seconds. Okay, let's have a look at the answer. So this is an example of a clumpy palsy. So clumpy palsy can present following shoulder dystocia during delivery, but it more commonly presents after there's a sudden upward jerk of the hand. So it's that vertical traction that's more common and that classically leads to a clumpy palsy. So a clumpy palsy is due to damage to the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. So this involves C8 to T1. So patients will present similar to the image with a hyperextended wrist, a clawed hand because they've lost the intrinsic hand musculature innovation. Okay, so let's have a look at number three. So again, you've got 10 seconds or you can pause the video. Okay, let's have a look at the answer. So this is due to a hypoglossal nerve palsy. So in a hypoglossal nerve palsy, which is the 12th cranial nerve, there will be an ipsilateral deviation of the tongue upon protrusion, an ipsilateral muscle wastage and fasciculation localized to the tongue. So in this scenario, you can see that the patient's tongue is deviated towards the right. This represents the, ch the patient has a right 12th nerve palsy or the right hypoglossal nerve has been damaged in some way. Now there are lots of causes of lesions to 12th nerve palsies and some of these involve either head and neck malignancy, penetrative trauma or a dissection to the internal carotid artery. So let's have a look at question number four. So you can either pause the video at this point or wait 10 seconds, it's entirely up to you. Okay, 
OK, let's find out the answer. So this is an example of a common perineal nerve palsy. So patients who present with a common perineal nerve palsy commonly present with what's known as a foot drop. So if you have a look at the picture, you can see that the patient who has a foot drop on the left foot is unable to dorsiflex the foot. Also, they will be unable to evert the foot. There will be a loss of sensation over the foot's dorsum and to compensate their foot drop, patients will often walk with this high steppage gait. So if you have a look at the picture in the far right hand corner, you can see an example of a high steppage gait. So that's when the patient has to raise their knee quite high and essentially sort of slap their foot on the floor. So they're walking with this pointed toe sort of slapped foot gait. And the best way of describing a high step gait to you is if you think about how Beyonce walks when she's on stage, that Beyonce strut is what I use to help me remember of, a, of what a high step gait looks like. So hopefully that image will help you remember that a high step gait is what patients who have a common perineal palsy, so they'll have a foot drop, will walk like in order to compensate for that foot drop. Now, a common perineal nerve palsy arises because of injury to the neck of the fibula. So this might be due to a tightly applied plaster cast to the lower limb, or a knee arthroplasty, or because it might be an itrogenic cause following a knee ligament repair. Okay, so let's have a look at question number five. So I'll give you 10 seconds to find out the answer for this. OK, so this is an example of a classical wrist drop. So wrist drop is representing a radial nerve palsy. So radial nerve palsy arises from a mid shaft fracture of the humerus. Now, like I said, it's classically known as a wrist drop, or sometimes it's known as a Saturday night palsy. Now, it's known as a Saturday night palsy because a patient might fall asleep with their arm drooped over the side of the chair and in the morning present with a palsy similar to this. So patients who present in this manner will have a loss of extension found upon their forearm, their wrist, their fingers and their thumb. Also, there'll be sensory loss in the first dorsal web space. And those are the key features that you need to remember when you're thinking about a radial nerve palsy. OK, let's look at the next question. So again, I'll give you 10 seconds or you can pause the screen. OK, let's go through the answers. So this is an example of an axillary nerve palsy. So an axillary nerve palsy classically presents in patients who have received an anterior dislocation to the shoulder or patients who have suffered from a fracture at the surgical neck of the humerus. Or unfortunately, it might be an iatrogenic injury following shoulder surgery. Now, these patients will classically present with a flattened deltoid. So if you have a look at our image, in the far right hand corner, you can see that the patient's right shoulder and in particular their right deltoid isn't as smooth compared to their left deltoid. So you can see that the muscle bulk has, is significantly reduced in the right deltoid compared to the left. And that's suggesting to you that this patient is suffering from a right sided axillary nerve palsy. Also, the patient will suffer from a loss of sensation over the regimental badge area. So if you have a look at the picture in the far top corner, you can see an example of a regimental badge site. So it's just on the side of your arm, localised to where the deltoid muscle overlies. And that area will have a loss of sensation. And that's because the axillary nerve would have provided some sensory sensation before 
So those are the two classical features of an auxiliary nerve palsy that you need to keep in mind for your exams. OK, so we'll move on to the next question. Okay, so this is an example of a long thoracic nerve palsy and if you have a look at the picture we can see that the patient's right long thoracic nerve has been damaged because it's presenting with winging of the right scapula. So this is commonly a complication following from a mastectomy or sometimes a sporting, imagery, a sporting injury where patients have had a blow to the ribs. Now, we can accentuate the winging of the scapula by asking the patients to push forwards against a wall. And this really helps to accentuate the winging of the scapula in a long thoracic nerve palsy because the vertebral border of the scapula and the inferior angle of the scapula becomes far more prominent. OK, so if you're happy with that, we'll move on to question number eight. So again, you've got 10 seconds or you can pause the screen. OK, let's find out the answer. So this is an example of an ulnar nerve palsy. So an ulnar nerve palsy classically presents following from a medial epicondyle fracture. And they'll present with clawing of the hand. So you can look at the picture in the corner and hopefully you, you can appreciate the clawing of the hand. Also, with an ulnar nerve palsy, there'll be a loss of sensation over the fifth digit and, order, and also the medial aspect of the fourth digit. So just to clarify, patients will present with clawing of the hand and loss of sensation over the fifth digit and the medial aspect of the fourth digit. OK, so let's have a look at question number nine. So you've got 10 seconds to come up with a diagnosis or you can pause the screen. OK, let's find out the answer. So this patient is presenting with a median nerve palsy. So median nerve palsy is commonly a symptom or a feature of patients presenting with carpal tunnel syndrome. So these patients will present with muscle wastage in the thenar eminence. So that's just at the base of the thumb and, and hopefully you can appreciate that in the picture that we've got here. So there's a loss of sensation on the palmar aspect to the first digit, the second digit and the third digit. Also, there's loss of sensation over the lateral aspect of the fourth digit. So that's the key features of a median nerve palsy. And um, please keep that in mind because median nerve palsies and carpal tunnel syndromes are very high yield topics which crop up in medical school final exams. OK, so let's have a look at question number 10. So I'll give you 10 seconds or you can pause the screen. OK, let's look at the answer. So hopefully you've picked out the fact that this patient is suffering from a Bell's palsy and a Bell's palsy is an example of a low motor neuron palsy. So this patient is suffering from a Bell's palsy and it's affecting the right side of his face because we can see that there's a facial muscle paralysis affecting the entire right side of his face. Also, it involves the right aspect of his forehead and that's key because facial muscle paralysis which spares the forehead is classically found in an upper motor neuron palsy however in lower motor neuron palsies there will be facial muscle paralysis including the forehead as well patients who present with bell's palsy or a low motor neuron palsy will also present with dry eyes and an altered sense of taste. There might be some sort of preceding post auricular pain before they develop the, fa the facial muscle paralysis. 
and it's really important that we administer prednisolone within 72 hours and also offer patients artificial tears and the artificial tears is used to alleviate the symptoms of having dry eyes but administering prednisolone within 72 hours is really really important in managing patients with a Bell's palsy. So Bell's palsy is usually idiopathic so healthcare professionals aren't, insure, aren't sure entirely what the underlying cause is but there are some discussions that Bell's palsy may be due to herpes simplex virus infection. Okay. So I'd just like to say thank you for joining me in today's video. Hopefully you found the quiz really useful. Please could I ask you to kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel, like my video and please share with your friends. Thank you for watching today and I wish you all the best with your final exams.